The reality around and within me is outstripping me. A thousand dazzled crystals stand in for the passing of time. I am stopped in my race. Nothing moves forward except my hypocritical hand across the paper. And from this lingering, residuary movement, I infer the brain activity that controls it. The embryonic waves that survive imperceptibly during a coma and contradict it since it contains the very principle of its opposite. My cursive handwriting bears witness to a second genesis that, though reduced to zero, is not altogether stopped simply because my hand doesn't stop racing. And so my torpor is merely a sudden and transient death. From my hand's vibratory course, I deduce that a manic river is discharging into my cephalic vein, its tumult displacing my names, all my childhoods, my failures, and whatever is left of my nights of love. This polluted trickle that gushes onto the page transports me utterly into the confusion of a flight. An uncertain Nile seeking its mouth. This driving current writes to me on the sand along the pages that still separate me from the lugubrious delta. Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today we're going to talk about French-Canadian author Hubert Aquin. If you watched my video a couple weeks earlier on Ha! A Self-Murder Mystery by Gordon Shepard, then you'll already kind of have a leg up on this one because that book is chronicling the life, the work, and ultimately the very deliberately and meticulously preconsidered and planned artistic suicide of that writer. As I said in that video, before reading the nonfiction book about Aquin, I decided to acquaint myself with his writing. So I read his very first novel, Next Episode, or prochain episode in the original French. This one is translated to the English by Sheila Fishman, who knew and spent time with and working with Aquin on these translations. She also did his final novel, his final finished novel, I should say, which originally was Neige Noir, or Black Snow, but was translated by Fishman as Hamlet's Twin. I did get my hands on all four of his novels in English right after I read this one, because after I read next episode, I thought, wow, this is definitely a writer for me. And in fact, the intensity of the way in which Ekan lived his life really comes through in the intensity of the prose. On the first reading of this, I had to be very deliberate to kind of slow down and not rush through the text just to get to the next fireworks display of magnificent prose, it, even though, you know, you don't really have to rush for that long to get from one to the other because it's so many of them in here. But I then went and got Blackout, which is the next one, True de Memoir, then the Antiphonary or L'Antiphonaire, and then finally Black Snow, Neige Noir. And I have only read the first two. So this video will only be on his first two novels, Next Episode and Blackout. And just from the first two and what I've picked through, scanned through, and what I know of the next two and all the books previously from Ha! A Self-Murder Mystery, while they all have a symbolic core, in form and content and prose style, they are all fairly different. He really pushed the boundaries of art just as he pushed the boundaries of life. And the more I've gotten acquainted with his work and with his life, the more I realized that the borders between life and art were nearly non-existent for a canon. I'm going to read through just a bunch of excerpts about Aquin and about his art that I took 
quoted from people who were interviewed in Ha. I'm just going to read through them quickly without any designation or attribution of from whom they came. They are from an array of acquaintances and friends and family, from his, basically his wife, Andre. They're from lovers, ex-lovers. They're from professors. They're from other writers. They're from poets. They're from respected critics. But this will give you an idea of how people saw Aquin. I think his writings, by their inspiration and their tone, constitute the most personal and the most intelligent French-Canadian literature of the 20th century. Aquin lived and wrote on the margins of society. Quebec society can't comprehend Aquin, neither the old nor the young. He was essentially a cultural phenomenon in a society whose culture is disappearing. If he were alive, I would still be his prisoner because his force, his strength, was such that I never saw a man with such power over other people. In Quebec, our greatest writer is Hubert Aquin. Hubert became the first recipient of Le Prix de la Presse, created specifically for him, and I believe that was in response to his third novel, L'Antifonaire. It's the first time in the history of Quebec, I believe, that people of all kinds were affected by the death of a great writer, as if it were the death of a great actor or a great singer. People said, we just lost our greatest writer. I heard that often. It was said by all sorts of people, no matter what their social standing. He was a lively guy. He personified living intensely. I found him intellectually very stimulating. He also enraged me. I found that he was a great writer. I found that he was a source of ferment in society, something that animates a society in an extraordinary way. Akin once told me that Joyce's novel Ulysses was a constant inspiration to him. This is actually from a letter that Akin himself wrote and was published in Mamis. The self is an intertext, the consciousness of a self, a disordered commentary. Marginalia sometimes discernible, but nevertheless always forming, always establishing themselves. The finite is bordered delicately by its own infinite. It's as if a luminous shadow enveloped the darkening light of intelligence. He was an extremely secretive man and prodigiously jealous. He had an extraordinary background in esoteric thought. He was a fanatic about Pythagoras. He was by far the most cultivated of us all. Hubert was fascinated by numbers. Morally, he was of an unheard of complexity. He was, I would say, completely mad. That is, exuberant, disconcerting, with a way of reasoning that was both complex and precise. Each time I had a discussion with Hubert, I felt myself drawn into his skein of reasoning, which I always found impeccable. Indeed, I stood in admiration before his thought. Sometimes we talked about films, especially those of the Japanese director, Akira Kurosawa, whom he admired. He adored Flaubert. He was fascinated by guns. He adored guns. He took teaching very seriously, and he prepared his courses like nobody else at the university. Hubert was a human being more sensitive than most. He was a guy who lived intensely and in an exemplary and dramatic fashion, the conflicts and ambivalences carried by a whole generation. He is not an easy artist. You might say that I became completely distraught when reading Uber, while I aspire to be calm, peaceful, in accord with myself. Reading him, I become broken up, spattered everywhere. For me, Uber's death marked the end of a belief held for 30 years after the Second World War of a Renaissance man, of the possibility of the establishment of the just society not just here in Quebec or Canada, but throughout the Western world. So his death symbolized for me the end of the dream, the end of my innocence, of my belief in that dream. He was always under the influence of barbiturates, though he hid it well. He was a profoundly selfish man. He manipulated everybody. The universe of Aquin, the artist, is nothing but surprises and shocks. And the best way to understand this is to read his novels. Trude de Memoir, or Blackout, for example, demonstrates to what extent Hubert can see things from various points of view and at various levels. As he says of his books, I want to create a spectacle. So we can't be surprised that he did the same thing 
in life. Next episode is a wild concept, and it has a key significance with a turning point in Akan's life. He started out as a very high-ranking and well-known revolutionary for the Québécois Separatistes. And then he went underground, and he got caught by the police and imprisoned, but then on grounds of temporary insanity, he was then put in the Albert Prévost psychiatric ward for evaluation. And while he was there, he began writing what would become his first novel, and thus turned from revolutionary, from businessman, from a filmmaker, to a writer. And so in this novel, he uses his real life goings on as the conceit. It takes the form of an imprisoned revolutionary who is passing the time by writing or trying to write a spy novel about a revolutionary who is tracking down a counter-revolutionary, but then it's also about his love, K here, with whom he wants to be reunited. So as you can see, there's a lot going on. There's multiple perspectives. There's a lot of meta text going on. So you can describe it as a meta fiction as well, because it's constantly arcing back and forth between the projection of the writer protagonist, the imprisoned or institutionalized writer protagonist projected into the revolutionary spy, but also projected into his former self with his lover Kay. And so this allows Akin to create this hypnotic, multi-leveled, yet superimposed blend of the different characters' personae and their thoughts and actions, where there is this institutionalized revolutionary, yes, but merged and swirled into the ebb and flow of his projection into this spy persona and the real memories of his times with his lover Kay. It's quite a production, and especially when all of it's being balanced within one man's head, and we're also getting glimpses at all of this being pinned at the same time. I want out of here. I'm afraid of getting used to this shrunken space. I'm afraid that greedily drinking in the impossible will change me, and that when I'm set free, I won't be able to walk on my own two feet. I'm afraid of waking up degenerated, stripped of identity, annihilated. Someone who isn't me, with eyes wild and brain purged of any antecedent, will walk through the gate on the day of my liberation. Everything breaks free here except me. Words slip by, and time. The alpine landscape. He keeps projecting himself and the spy to one of his favorite places, and a kind of in real life's favorite places in Switzerland. And the Vaudois villages, while I, I shudder in my imminence and perform a dance of possession inside a prescribed circle. There is indeed this fluidity of landscape and time between Montreal and Switzerland. And that happens from the very first sentence. And indeed, as many people who read the book when it first came out have said in both the book by Shepard and in a film by Jacques Gabot, Akin captures something in this novel and in his other books that creates the perfect symbolism of what the majority of the Quebecois feel and felt. The colonized mind aching for liberation, the feeling of being imprisoned and underground, yet with a culture of extreme passion pulsing through your veins. I am the fragmented symbol of Quebec's revolution its fractured reflection, and its suicidal incarnation. Within myself, explosive and depressed, an entire nation grovels historically and recounts its lost childhood in bursts of stammered words and scriptural raving. But on top of the symbolism and on top of the story that's quite uh, an amazing production, you really also get a sense of Akin's intensity and his intelligence and his 
repository of language and knowledge from different fields and disciplines from the prose itself. There's just passage after passage of powerful poetic paroxysms of prose pyrotechnics. The second sentence, packed inside my sentences, I glide, a ghost, into the river's neurotic waters, discovering as I drift the underside of surfaces. I have nothing to gain from going on writing, but I go on anyway, though I'm writing at a loss. No, that's a lie. For the past few minutes, I've known perfectly well that I will gain something from this game. I'll gain time. An interval I cover with erasures and phonemes, fill with syllables and howls, cram with all my acknowledged atoms, multiples of a totality they'll never equal. I compose in highly automatic writing, and while I'm spelling myself, I avoid homicidal lucidity. I dazzle myself with words, and I drift complacently because this procedure lets me gain in minutes what I lose proportionately in despair. I stuff the page with mental mincemeat. I cram it to the bursting point with syntax. I pound at the naked paper. I can barely keep from writing with both hands at once. Suddenly I'd been struck down, carried away with the trees and my memories at the speed of that cruel wave, swept along in the decanted vomit of our national history. I am not writing, I am written. The future act has long since known me. The uncreated novel is dictated to me word by word and I appropriate it as I go. Following the Geneva Convention on Literary Copyright, I am creating something that outdistances me, that sets down before me the mark of my unpredictable footprints. The imagination is a scar. I live my own invention, and what I kill is already dead. The images I imprint on my retina were already there. I do not invent. This broken book resembles me. This mass of paper is a product of history, an unfinished fragment of my own essence, and thus an impure testimony to the faltering revolution I continue to express in my own way through my institutionalized delirium. So that's next episode, and I will tell you that I was careful not to read my favorite poetic paroxysms of prose pyrotechnics. There are several passages of stunning aesthetic splendor. And in fact, I dare say that a couple of them were Carterescu-esque. But again, next episode was his first novel. Put him on the map as a great French-Canadian writer of the 20th century, if not the greatest, and is also his most well-known. His second novel, Trou de Mémoire, in the original French, Blackout in this English translation by Alan Brown has a totally different kind of conceit at play. And in fact, he now goes beyond the borders that he had already broken with his first novel. And he touches territory that really reminded me of Nabokov's Pale Fire, where he's handling multiple, I think four or five individuals who begin to use this book or the manuscript that's at the center of this book to tell their own stories, to indirectly argue and debate with one another, to amend each other. There are footnotes and insertions. There are letters. There is a manuscript, like I said. There are diaries and editorial comments. And then there are future editors coming in and adding footnotes to other editors' footnotes. And what we end up with is an anamorphic novel modeled on Holbein's painting, which features prominently in the book, The Ambassadors, where there's that crazy skull across the bottom that you have to look at from just the right angle. If I can give you one big tip about reading this book, it's to just read it the first time through. Don't try to take notes on it. Don't try to chart the characters. There's not a ton of complexity, really. There's a ton of playfulness and reversals and ambiguities, but it's juggling 
very few objects. So it's not that there's, you know, four generations of people where the patronymic is the same for all of them. It's not that way as it is with a lot of Latin American novels. I'm thinking of like a hundred years of solitude where you'll need to keep, and most of those books come with genealogies or genealogical trees in them. I say don't try to take notes the first time through on this one because things will just keep changing on you. Things really aren't as they seem. I was trying to construct my own notes and bullet points about what this story was and who all these different figures were, the ones appearing outside of the manuscript, the editors and so on, only to finally then run into comments from one or more of them that completely contradicted stuff that came before it. And it isn't until the very end that you get a clearer sense of what's going on. But just in general, the, the basic plot if I can do this succinctly, is that there is a very well-known French-Canadian revolutionary in Quebec who is also a pharmacist. And he is very well-known now. He's given this speech that stirred things up. And there is a Nigerian revolutionary, I believe, an African revolutionary, along the Ivory Coast, who hears about this Quebecois revolutionary. Now, this guy, his name is Olymp, and he also happens to be a pharmacist. And so there's a lot of affinities. And he hears about the revolutionary, whose name, by the way, is Pierre Magnon. And Olymp hears about Pierre Magnon because Pierre is dating the sister of a girl, Rachel Ruskin, that the Nigerian is dating, that the African revolutionary is dating. And so there are these crazy affinities, and we open up with Olymp writing to Pierre, basically asking him for a copy of the transcript of his speech that incited the revolution in Montreal. But then what we start to shift to is a manuscript that Pierre himself begins writing apparently after he has just killed Joan Ruskin. But furthermore, the way this is presented to us is by an editor. And so you'll see these constant footnotes where it says editor note. And there will be this full-on insertions throughout the text where the editor steps forward and starts talking. Upon having killed Joan, Pierre Magnon decides to write this autobiographical tell-all, this confessional. And it is that manuscript that we are getting by way of the editors or the editor. But it becomes editors because little by little, other personages start to make their own editorial amendments. Joan significantly happens to be an English Canadian woman. And her body becomes a site of eros and thanatos, of sensual love and death, eroticism and death. And really, there's a little bit of a symbolic parallel between the manuscript and Joan's body, between this book, really, and Joan's body, because they both become the site of conflicts between not only Pierre Magnon's hatred and love for his colonial oppressors and his own people, but the site of contention between all the characters in this book, Rachel Ruskin, Olymp, Pierre Magnon, and the editor. Furthermore, the editor clearly wants to be a novelist in his own right or a literary critic, which, you know, a lot of editorial work does require a, a bit of critical eye. And this is when that editorial voice steps forward and uses Holbein's ambassadors as a cipher through which to unlock the perceived secret message of Pierre's manuscript. And all of this is what I called in my Why Do We Read fiction series part of the ludic dimension of why we read. Why do we enjoy and keep coming back to Nabokov's novels like Pale Fire? It's because they're giving us such a high quotient of play, opportunity to engage in 
clever antics and puzzles. But this also yields the topic of literary imposture. An imposture of this kind can only be explained in a case like this if we invoke on behalf of the forger the excuse of a neurotic etiology. After all, the literary swindler abounds in the records of psychiatry, and the many studies of Fribourg Blanc on simulation give us to understand that literary imposture is comparable to certain types of exaggerative excitation, over-simulation, false confession, and other atypical pathological manifestations. And so the element of all these other voices, the editorial voice and the mysterious RR, redactor in some cases, amender, is that a word? These elements become the means of turning Pierre Magnon's autobiographical novel into a mystery. His whole project, this interlocking of events, is one of total and systematic revelation. Pierre X. Magnon tells this truth to a point where it is impossible to doubt his openness, not to mention his courage. For this very reason, the liberties he occasionally takes with truth, which he normally follows with almost scientific scrupulousness, remain inexplicable. The gaps, unpredictable and never consistent, constitute for me a positive mystery which I intend, modestly but systematically, to solve by supplementing his account with complementary or divergent versions of the same events, versions which I had communicated to me in person or by correspondence, because this editor was an acquaintance of Pierre's. At the culmination of my investigation, how I would love to emerge into some clear and simple apprehension of what I now find so disturbing. And so, like I said, the playfulness and the complex structuring of the novel that we see in next episode is ratcheted way up in Blackout. There's also a much larger technical vocabulary that's brought in. A lot from art history and pharmacology is brought to bear in this book. You sense that Hubert Aquin is growing in confidence and technical acumen from the first book to this one. And of course, there's still plenty of great prose pyrotechnics. This, I believe, and really Akin's whole craft as an artist, comes from one sentence early on in the book. There is only one possible law of style, right to the maximum of intensity and incantation. An ocean of melancholy froze in my mouth. An armada of ice flows sliced me in all directions at once. I have no homeland but this black Lyman, which casts on me the spell of its serrated shore, its amputated isthmuses. Yes, my homeland is no other than these shifting sands which embed Lagos in its jewel case of bluffs. Born of the sand, I try interminably to take root there, but I sink down and find my prison in the filigree of the littoral and the deltaic calligrams of the shoreline. I grow febrile. I vibrate to grief like a thin membrane in the hot wind of the lagoons. To a certain extent, I myself become bewitched by the written word, which I now secrete like a venomous glue that when it hits the page acquires the very consistency of those dead trees, which we can crumple with one hand when they are metamorphosed into a fuluginous web. It is not before Lake Le Mans that I am standing, but in the Gulf of Guinea, in that resplendent marina which prevents it from invading Lagos, pushing it back, but without violence, until the dark water swirls everywhere in a continuous vacillability which makes of all Lagos a veritable nodular and ramos angiosis with its canals, locks, fluid ribbons, and blurred and muddy entrecotes. This sentence towards the end will not make sense if you haven't read the book, and I also don't think it will give anything away, but I think it's just beautifully stated and gives a great hook to unraveling what this means. Strange sort of editor, 
chasing the shadow of the woman killed by the author of an unfinished novel, which I'm finishing this moment with my belly full of his child. This one really showcases Akin's ability also to creatively think through a rather complex plot and shows his penchant for the life of spies and double and even triple agents and epiphanies and shocks and reversals. And so I now can't wait to see what he does in the Antiphonary, L'Antiphonaire. And then I'll be honest, from what I've read and know of his final finished novel, Neige Noir, Black Snow, I'm quite terrified <laughs> to read that one. And I'm reminded of one of his friends who said that when they read Akin, they feel themselves spattered everywhere. I have to admit that I am totally shocked and taken aback and impressed by the work of Hubert Aquin. Just so thrilled and so thankful to have discovered his work. So thankful to Alan Brown and Sheila Fishman for translating some of it into English which actually recalls one other thing that I didn't bring up in my Ha video, and that's the notion that for all of Akan's revolutionary and Quebecois separatist inclinations and values, the preservation of French-Canadian culture in face of oppressive English-Canadian culture, in the end, Akan, like James Joyce, found that he would have to write in the language of his oppressors to find that wider audience. And it just reminds me once again of how much incredible writing is out there that I don't even know about. If you haven't read Akin, I hope that this video on his first two novels, translated in English, sparks something in you. Please get your hands on it, read it, enjoy it, reread it. Let me know what you think.